Okay. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of this course for the kind invitation. It's an honor for me to be here. So I will speak about causes, detection, risk factors, and management of proteinuria. There is no a consistent definition of proteinuria. However, it is commonly accepted that physiologic proteinuria does not exceed 150 milligrams per 24 hours in adults and 140 milligrams per square meter of blood surface in children. There is a physiologic proteinuria which contains mainly tamosyl glycoprotein, which is produced by the thick uh, distal uh, ascending uh, uh, loop of ends uh, of NS loop, and uh, which also contains albumin, roughly on the average 16 milligrams per day, however less than 30 milligrams per day. As to pathological proteinuria, we know that we have glomerular proteinuria, tubular proteinuria, overflow proteinuria, and functional proteinuria. Glomerular proteinuria is the most frequent and the most clinically relevant and challenging for both the patient and the doctor. It is increased, it is due to increased permeability of the glomerular filter to proteins of large molecular size. It always contains albumin, but not only that. It is due to many mechanisms, the main of which are listed here. There is a loss of fixed anionic charge, detachment of the epithelial podocytes, leukocyte and monocyte products, which are active especially in proliferative glomerulonephritis, activation of the pro-inflammatory C5BC9 complement complex, which has been investigated and found being, being active, especially in membranes nephropathy. And there also are glomerular hemodynamics involved, which are very important, especially for what we will say in the last part of this presentation about management of proteinuria. Because there is an increase in this in glomerular diseases, there's also very frequently documented the presence of an increase in the glomerular pressure, which increases diffusion of proteins into glomerular space. Then we have tubular proteinuria, which is due to tubular damage which may occur either in tubular interstitial disease and in glomerular disease. Very, very early, it exceeds 1.5 grams per 24 hours. And it is characterized by the presence in the urine of protein with low molecular weight, such as beta-2 microglobulin, lysozyme, retinal binding protein, and alpha-1 microglobulin. Overflow proteinuria is due to a marked increase in the plasma concentration of proteins, which are physiologically filtered by the glomerulus. As a consequence, the amount of proteins and the filtrate exceeds the reabsorptive capacity of the proximal tubule. Thus, the protein excess ends up into urine. The best and most common example is the presence of immunoglobulin light chains and light chains fragments in the urine of patients with monoclonal gammopathies. Finally, we have functional proteinuria, which is due mainly to altered intraglomerular hemodynamics. This is seen in uh, patients with fever, after strenuous physical exercise, and in congestive heart failure. This type of proteinuria is usually transient. And then we have orthostatic proteinuria, again associated with intraglomerular hemodynamic changes. How to detect proteinuria? Testing urine samples for the presence of proteinuria is an essential part of the identification of kidney diseases. We have different possibilities to detect and quantitate proteinuria in the urine. We have reagent strip, lipstick. We have 24-hour urine excretion. We have protein to creatinine or albumin to creatinine ratio on a random urine sample and other methods. What about the reagent strip? The reagent strip, I have a box here, is based on plastic sticks which bear several pads. I want to show you here. Each pad being impregnated with chemical reagents. 
and each specific chemical reagent is a, develop a chemical reaction which is meant to detect a specific urine feature. And the results are obtained by matching the color developed in the bed with the color scale reported on the box. You cannot see here, but I will show you some slides with the full spectrum of colors. Thus, you plunge the dipstick into the urine. This is not urine, but the litmus. You take it out, you wait for some seconds, and then you compare the color you have on the stick with the color you have on the box. You see here? And this is the full spectrum of analyze, which can be examined with and tested with multi-stick. You have blood, which is hemoglobin, bilirubin, urobilinogen, ketones, proteins, which actually is only albumin, nitrites, glucose, pH, specific gravity, and leukocyte, which is actually is leukocyte esterase. The reagent strip have uh, several important advantages. They have low cost, they are very simple to be used, and they are used as a first line and a screening test. And they offer you a full urine profile. You know only you don't only have the presence or absence of proteins, but also you know you have information about hemoglobin and other parameters which are very important. However, this method also have, has disadvantages. It supplies only semi-quantitative results and it is susceptible to interference substances which should be known by the user of dipsticks. It is influenced by urine discoloration which may hamper in, different, in various proportion, in different proportion, the examination. And there is also subjectivity when the reading is by eye. And there is time sensitivity for reading which must be respected and is usually reported on each box uh, uh, from uh, each uh, uh, producer. What about the reagent strip for albumin? The presence of albumin in a buffer, which in this case is bromphenol, causes a change of pH that is proportional to the concentration of the albumin itself. Thus, according to the change in pH, we have a change in the color. This dipstick is almost exclusively sensitive to albumin it doesn't detect tubular proteins and no light chains. The detection limit varies uh, from 250 to 300 milligram per deciliter, roughly, which changes according to the brand of the dipstick itself. The results are only semi-quantitative. False negative results are seen if the urine is diluted, while there are false, false positive results if the urine is strongly alkaline, and or if it, if it contains drugs such as, such as phenazopyridine or chloroquine. What about quantitative measurement of proteinuria? We have turbidimetric methods, dye bonding techniques, and biorate methods. These ones are the best ones today because they are sensitive in the same way to all proteins and they have minimal interference from drugs, radiographic media, etc., etc. Once we have identified the best method to quantitate and measure urine protein, which sample we should we use to measure proteinuria? This is a big topic. We have 24-hour urine collection, which still is the reference gold standard method, because it averages the variation of proteinuria due to circadian rhythm with peak levels at midday and nadir levels overnight and early morning. And it is the most accurate method for the monitoring of proteinuria during treatment. However, it is impractical in several settings, such as children, elderly patients, uneducated subjects to whom you have to explain how to collect the 24-hour urine out patients. Errors due to overcollection or undercollection are very common. More than 25% overcollection and more than 40% undercollection. Oops, doesn't go. For some reason, it doesn't.
just say three minutes. For all these reasons, there is now a common view on 24-hour urine collection. It's a chore for the patient and a nuisance for the physician because for each collection, it must be determined whether it is a complete urine collection or not. And these are two proposed formulas to know whether or not the urine collection is complete. I'm sure that nobody here has been using these formulas. What about urine protein creatinine ratio on a random sample? This has been proposed since 2002 as an alternative to 24-hour urine collection. And the whole story starts in 1983 when Gisberg and co-workers published in the New England Journal of Medicine this paper in which they showed that there was a significant correlation between 24-hour protein excretion and the ratio between protein and creatinine on a random sample. After that uh, paper, many, many studies on a very wide range of patient groups have demonstrated a close correlation between PCR on a random sample with 24-hour protein excretion. Uh, and the advantages of this method are very clear. The urine sample is easy to obtain, just one spot sample. There are no influences by variations in water intake and rate of diuresis. And the same sample can be used for microscopic investigation, while the 24-hour urine sample cannot be used for microscopic investigation due to lysis of particles occurring over time. How are the results expressed with this method? Usually as milligram per deciliter of protein on milligram per deciliter of creatinine. But nowadays, many studies use milligram on gram or milligrams on millimoles. And with this method, various cutoffs have been identified for normal value of proteinuria ranging from 0.2 to 0.3 and to define nephrotic proteinuria from 3 to 3.5 in different patient populations. This method too, however, has limitations. It overestimates in females and in the elderly the uh, rate of proteinuria, which is due to reduced urine creatinine excretion in these categories because of reduced mass on mass. There is also the influence of timing of the sample due to daily circadian rhythm of proteinuria compared to a relative constancy of 24-hour creatinine urine excretion. So it has been shown that you may have a result in the morning, which differs greatly uh, in the result of the random sample collected in the afternoon. And there is a poor correlation in 24-hour excretion at moderate to high levels of proteinuria. For all these reasons, in 2006, in this paper published in Current Opinion of Phrology and Habitation, which is an influential journal, in the neurological uh, <coughs> community, there was this conclusion, this statement. Spot urine PCR is useful to exclude the presence of a significant proteinuria, to rule out significant proteinuria. But once we have significant proteinuria, the agreement between spot urine and 24 hours appears to be poor, and the utility of spot urine measurements in monitoring response to therapy remains to be established. For the shortness of time, I will, I, I will not show some slides, which, however, I have here in the presentation in the, as a resource. And what about albumin creatinine ratio? This has been proposed as an alternative to protein creatinine ratio. And several national guidelines suggest to use this ratio to monitor diabetic patients, while PCR should be used for non-diabetic patients. A DOCI guidelines in 2000, of 2007 state that ACR is acceptable if ACR is more than 500 or 1,000 milligrams per gram of creatinine. However, there are again two problems. Albumin assays are very expensive compared to protein assays. Here, 77 United States dollars versus 25 dollars for one determination. 
And also there are discrepancies between ACR and PCR. As it has been shown very nicely in this paper published by Atkins from Australia in 2003, there was 8% of patients with proteinuria who did not have albuminuria, which may depend on the underlying renal disease. So if you use in non-diabetic patients just ACR, you are at the risk of missing patients with proteinuria. And what do k clinical practice guidelines for glomerulonephritis published last year say? There is currently some fish insufficient evidence to preferentially recommend 24-hour, shorter time or spot urine collections for penuria management in glomerulonephritis. I think this is a very important big topic and uh, I would be happy to discuss about it with you. And now microalbuminuria. Microalbuminuria defines the urinary discretion of albumin in a range of 30 to 190 milligrams at 24 hours. In diabetics and the general population, it identifies the subjects who are at increased risk of CKD, cardiovascular morbidity, and overall mortality. In addition, in diabetics, it is associated with a higher probability of developing over uh, diabetic nephropathy. This happens because microalbuminuria reflects a state of generalized impairment of vascular function, with the kidney acting as a window to the vasculature in other tissue compartments. So, microalbuminuria does not cause cardiovascular disease. It just identifies patients who need more intensive therapy, including modification of lifestyle and closer follow-up. These are all the factors which are involved with the appearance of microalbuminuria. How can microalbuminuria be identified and measured? There are several semi-quantitative reagent strip tests which can be used, but once it has been identified by one of these methods, microalbuminuria must be confirmed by quantitative methods, such as nephelometry, radioimmunosay, ELISA methods, and HPMC methods. Today... Excuse me, could you... Could you just uh, okay. make the mic uh, closer? Yes, okay. Uh, today, ACR on the first morning urine has largely replaced time urine collections for the measurement of microalbuminuria for both screening and monitoring purposes. Proteinuria as a risk factor. I saw that tomorrow uh, Professor De Breuil will speak about kidney and uh, cardiovascular system. So I have just two or three slides on that. Many, 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 many papers have demonstrated that proteinuria is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, independent of GFR, hyperpressure, or diabetes. And it is also a very important risk factor for CKD progression, as demonstrated in uh, this uh, slide. You see here in a MDRD study, different degrees of proteinuria associate, are associated with different degrees of GFR decrease per year, which has been demonstrated also in this study published in 1997. How does proteinuria cause kidney damage? Proteins exposure stimulate proximal tubular cells to synthesize chemokines and uh, recruit monocytes, T cells, and interleukins, and interleukins that attract neutrophils and fibrosis promoting molecules. Over time, these processes lead to interstitial fibrosis, which is a very important factor in GFR reduction and progression of CKD. And now, how to treat proteinuria? For this part of my lecture, I will use what is said, the main message of this paper, which has been published in JAST in 2003 by a group of Ohio State University which is a big expert, which, is, which has a big experience on the field. And in the paper, there are several types of recommendations, level one, two, and three. I leave it myself to level, level, tie, level one recommendations, which are based on one or more high quality controlled clinical trial. So we will deal with control blood pressure, with ACE inhibitor and uh, ARB therapy. We will go through 
combine ACE inhibitors and ARB, and some other recommendations. First of all, blood pressure. Three large studies mentioned here evaluated the effect on proteinuria of usual goal blood pressure, which is 140, roughly, on 85, versus low goal blood pressure, which is 125 on 75. Low goal, low goal blood pressure was associated with a reduction of proteinuria by 50%, and the greater the proteinuria, the greater was the reduction of proteinuria in, MDR, in MDRD studies. While in the other two studies, prevention, the, reduc the uh, reduction of blood pressure to low goal prevented twofold or threefold the increase of proteinuria. Second point, start with ACE inhibitors or ARB. The strategy is to achieve blood pressure goal using drugs which are antiproteinuric and attenuate angiotensin II and aldosterone. This is achieved with ACE inhibitors and ARBs. This is the RAS system. We have angiotensinogen, which is activated by renin and transformed into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin converting enzyme transforms angiotensin 1 in angiotensin 2, which is active on angiotensin receptors, the most important of which is angiotensin receptor 1, which is associated with vasoconstriction, increased aldosterone secretion, sodium, sodium reabsorption, hypertrophy, oxidative stress, inflammation, and fibrosis. It is important to know that, however, there is a non-ACE pathway which leads to the production on ANGE2, which actually escapes the action of ACE inhibitors. And it is also important to know that there is a local production of angiotensin 2 which again escapes ACE inhibition. And this is the basis, the rational basis, for using not only ACE inhibitors, but also ARB together. Then combine ACE inhibitor with ARB. The optimum strategy for this group appears to be the addition of ARB to maximum ACE inhibitors in those who fail to achieve the proteinuria goal, which ideally is also for guidelines below 500 mg per day on ACE inhibitor alone. And we must uh, remember that antiproteinuric effect of ACE inhibitors and ARB is uh, dose dependent. The efficacy and the advantages and disadvantages of uh, combined therapy has been reviewed by several meta-analyses, the last of which has been published just recently in the American Journal of Hypertension by this group. In this paper, 59 studies were evaluated, which included almost 5,000 patients. Most combined therapy was based on ACE inhibitors plus ARB. 11% of studies included a treatment with ACE inhibitors or ARB plus anti-aldosterone receptor, mainly spironolactone. 6% of studies included ACE, or B, ACE inhibitors plus ARB plus aliskiron, which is a direct renin antagonist, while only 2% of studies included ACE inhibitors plus ARB plus aldosterone receptor antagonist. And what were the results of this impressive meta-analysis? Combined versus single RAS blockade was associated with a significant decrease in albuminuria and in proteinuria. And 9.4% of patients, higher rate of patients, obtain a regression to normal, to normal albuminuria. And a high 5% higher rate patients in the combined group achieved the blood pressure goals, both in terms of systolic, diastolic, and medium blood pressure. And in a subgroup analysis, they also found that the combined uh, treatment uh, were more was uh, give reduction of proteinuria, which was more pronounced in patients without diabetes, in those with well-controlled hypertension, and again, the importance of having as a first step a good control of hypertension, and in patients with preserved renal function. The paper, however, also showed that the combination of drugs was associated with some 
problems with some risk for the patients. In fact, it was associated with a significant net decrease in GFR, a significant net increase in serum potassium level, with a 3.4% higher rate of hyperkalemia and a 4.6% higher rate of hypotension. Thus, the conclusion of the study was, okay, use the combined therapy. However, do not forget that it must be used judiciously with close monitoring of patient blood pressure, kidney function, and serum potassium. This applies especially to patients with advanced renal disease and patients with more severe cardiovascular disease and in the elderly. What do the KDGO clinical practice guideline for GN say? They say the same thing. Treatment of hypertension, the goal is this, with ACE inhibitors and or ARB as a first choice. What about proteinuria? The goal is less, try to obtain less than 500 mg per 24 hours with ACE inhibitors and or, and or ARB. If we continue with the recommendation of the paper I have mentioned at the beginning of this last part of my talk, another recommendation is avoid the hydropyridine calcium antagonists, such as amlodipine and nifedipine, because they are not antiproteinuric and may actually promote proteinuria due to their vasodilatory effects, which cause glomerular hypertension. And in a paper, and again, a meta-analysis paper, it has been shown then that uh, non dihydropyridinic drugs, such as diltiazem and verapamil, on the contrary, they can reduce significantly proteinuria independently on, of their role on blood, systolic blood pressure. Use beta-blocker drugs because it has been shown in this study, which I have already mentioned before, sustained release metoprolol has antiproteinuric effects nearly equal to that of ramipril, and control protein intake, because the same group have, have demonstrated that the reduction of protein, or of a good protein intake can decrease proteinuria by 50%. We, can, we also have other papers which, can, which demonstrate that there is something more which can be done beyond the blockade of renin angiotensin system. This paper has been, again, just published in Nature Review of Nephrology, and it focuses its attention on the importance of the restriction of sodium intake in patients with proteinuria. The author of this paper, of this paper perform a post-hoc pooled analysis of renal and IDNT studies. Both these studies were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001. In this study, the effect of losartan on uh, renal employment was evaluated against versus placebo, while in this study, irbesartan was evaluated against the effect of amlodipine and placebo. This study showed that losartan actually reduces the renal endpoints and cardiovascular uh, disease. This study demonstrated, again, that it was possible to obtain with an ARB drug a reduction of uh, renal endpoints and cardiovascular disease and mortality. And it also showed that it, could po it was possible to obtain with irbesartan a substantial reduction of proteinuria. Well, the postdoc pooled analysis of these papers performed uh, recently show that another important factor in influencing the renal events and the cardiovascular event is the content of sodium in the diet. In these three bars here, we have the sodium intake, 8 grams, 10 grams, 12 grams per day. You see that the higher the intake, the higher the annual incidence of renal and cardiovascular events. But what is important, the higher the sodium intake is, uh, the higher is the proteinuria, red dotted bars, which is independent on the effects of on, uh, blood pressure. And another important message, and again, it doesn't work here. Okay. And another important message which comes from this study is that the reduction of sodium intake, the, there is an ideal sodium intake re restriction, 
which is at this level. So it has been, it shows that a salt intake of five to six grams per day is the best one in order to avoid complications which may be associated with either too low sodium intake or too high sodium intake. Thus, the paper ends with this take home message, which I think is very important. The addition of dietary sodium restriction to single agent uh, REAS blockade, rather than adding another uh, agent, blocking agent, seems, seems to be a potent, a feasible strategy to mitigate the burden of renal and cardiovascular disease in patients with CKD. So the suggestion is use the reduction of sodium intake rather than using two drugs, which exposes you to higher costs and to higher risks. Finally, another end on uh, possible drugs which may, which may reduce proteinuria is the use of paracarcitol, which is a, a, an activator of vitamin D receptor. This has been published a couple of three years ago in the Lancet. This is the result of a multinational placebo-controlled double-blind trial uh, using uh, a one or two micrograms per day for 24 weeks versus placebo. And you see that the use of two micrograms per day of paracalcitol actually reduced albuminuria, particularly in those with high, uh, high dietary sodium intake, reduced GFR estimated GFR and systolic blood pressure. All effects were observed within four weeks and fairly stable without major side effects. Thus, the conclusion, proteinuria is an ominous manifestation of CKD, which identifies patients who are at greatly increased risk of CKD progression, CV, cardiovascular disease, and death. Thus, it is of the highest importance to, one, detect and properly quantitate proteinuria with all the open problems we still have on this point, and use the best possible therapeutic approach to reduce proteinuria to the lowest possible level, however, without forgetting possible severe side effects. Thank you very much for your kind attention.